Good evening. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Ishan Russell. And uh, today we've decided to focus on Queen Elizabeth II because she's become the longest serving British monarch in history. Now, what does that mean for Britain? Uh, because there is a lot of uh, patriotism on display uh, uh, in the UK right now. Also, the fact that uh, she's not just the head of uh, Britain in that uh, sense of uh, being the head of state, but also of Commonwealth nations who are also equally, where she's also equally popular. So what makes her that popular? What has made monarchy last this long? The last century was considered the end of monarchy, but monarchy survived. And uh, not just in Britain, there are other countries where it's thriving as well. And we'll be talking about all this and more in the idea of the larger idea of monarchy. And we're joined uh, by Satish Jacob, veteran journalist, Sheetal Sharma, assistant professor at JNU, specializing in European studies. Lord Meghnath Desai, British economist, will be joining us on the phone line. And we're joined by Patrick French, He's a British writer and a historian. And Sanjeev Srivastava, senior journalist and former India editor of the BBC, will also be joining us. Uh, thank you very much for all of you for coming in. Sheeta, ladies first, I'll start with you. Uh, as far as Queen Elizabeth II is concerned, uh, in terms of monarchy, I mean, she's one monarch who's uh, braved a lot. She's seen history. She is history in that sense of having witnessed such a large uh, part of the century and being playing such a pivotal role with the UK and Britain playing such a pivotal role in it? Uh, it has been, uh, it is stated that at 5.30 p.m., you know, right. she surpasses any other record, you know, mm. of uh, the previous uh, uh, longest reigning monarch. And the interesting part is that, that uh, she had, as David Cameron had also written in one of the forewords of a, a recently published book, that she has been able to carry her reign throughout mm with grace, dignity, and decency, mm. you know? And uh, to do that, it requires a lot of gut, a lot of patience, a lot of, you know, management of your public uh, image, and the ability to tide over many of the controversies that came, you know, right. uh, from the... And Especially the, in 1992 and the 90s period, that was yes. quite difficult for her. and particularly when the family grew and with generations coming and with so many people entering, you know, uh, into the lives of the people of the royal family. But somehow the queen has been able to maintain that royal image with mm. too much of, you know, regality and all that, in which both her silence and her voices have played a very, uh, you know, balanced role mm. in keeping that image that is very intact. Mm. And at times, this was a dignified silence over some of the things which were best not discussed in public. Right. And at times, it was a, a small statement or a comment. Right. But somehow, she has managed to not give any kind of, you know, uh, uh, flaring up of any right. of so, the debates I mean, which were... In my reading up, because uh, uh, what uh, biographers have called uh, is an incredibly shy person, that perhaps helped uh, Queen Elizabeth to become such a long-serving mm -hmm. monarch. Satish Jacob, you've written through uh, the annals of history about uh, personalities such as this. What makes Queen Elizabeth II stand out? Because she came in at a very difficult time for Britain. I mean, the Second World War, Britain was recovering from it. And in terms of uh, the influence of the British Empire, that had certainly receded. But uh, she still enjoys that kind of popular support in the UK. I think what has kept her going is sheer endurance, the quality of just being there. Um, but I'm not, uh, I'm not discounting all the excellent patience and the things she has shown and the regalia along with it. But the point is, Britain is a unique country. Mm -hmm. I remember I was a student, a schoolboy, when King Farouk of Egypt was dethroned. Right. It was in the early 50s. And he said something which has st stuck in my mind. He said, in the end, there are going to be only five bonus left in this world. Four in the playing cards and the fifth of the monarch of Britain. Mm. What a prophecy. Mm. He, he said there's going to be no monarchy left mm. except playing cards, four kings mm. and the, the monarch of Britain, which is very true. The thing is that the British people, they love pomp and show. They right. love the royalty. Mm. They may not, I mean, she's not a head of state, as you say. She doesn't have the power. But they want it there. Mm. She's a very comforting thought. Mm. Recently, there was a census among the young people in Britain, mm. uh, between the ages of 15 to 25 or something, recently, where 61% of these young people said that they want monarchy to continue. Right. 
So, you know, this charisma, it is unexplainable. She hasn't been a statesman, uh, and she came at a time when, when her father, mm. uh, King George V, suddenly died. Yeah, she was just 25 when she took over the reins. Sorry? Term. She was just 25 uh, when... Yeah, uh, she was very young. Mm. It was early 1950s. Um, and she's wonderful, dignified. All right. Well, also, but there is an entire sort of office and a machinery behind uh, keeping uh, the royal family up in terms of and not just the money, but just the, the, the minds that go into keeping up that image, as uh, Sheetal was talking about. Lord Meghnath Desai is joining us from London. And uh, Lord Desai, I mean, uh, you must be seeing over there. What's the mood across the UK as far as Queen Elizabeth II is concerned and the fact that she's become the longest serving British monarch? Well, it's a, it's a very, very celebratory uh, sort of situation. All the newspapers have got um, her on the front page with supplements. The Times even has got all the monarchs of uh, uh, Britain ever, from the longest serving to the shortest serving, you know, as a sort of a supplement. No, I think what it is is that, uh, you know, uh, in a sense, the monarchy try, com manages to combine both remoteness as well as familiarity. Mm. So people feel that, you know, here is somebody they can meet, somebody they can see, and sometimes they do meet, you know, at some garden parties or when she's traveling around. And uh, I, have, I have met her, you know, three, four times, maybe more. She has a great ability. If she meets you, she knows you are very nervous. You want to see a lot of things. She gives you her undivided attention for one minute. And then she passes on. You don't feel rejected. You feel you have seen the queen, you talk to her. And it is an amazing, amazing ability she has, mm. which she sort of manages all the time that mm. she, she shakes hands with you, she listens to you, and then she passes on. So nobody kind of detains her very long. Mm. And she appears absolutely ordinary, like, like your mother or, or, you know, like your neighbor. No, she doesn't wear the tiara in, in, when she goes around in the public. She wears ordinary clothes, and very often people remark that she's wearing the same old clothes she wore before. Mm -hmm. You know, so in a sense, the monarchy tries to be kind of middle class, but kind of remote. And it's, it's an unusual combination, and she has carried it off. And, that's and perhaps... the, uh, the energy of this woman, you know, she's, what, 89 now or something. Yes. It's absolutely amazing. Absolutely, yeah, indeed. The amount and of work she puts she, in. Yes, she certainly does. Because uh, once again, uh, coming from her biographers, I think it's the fact that she's devoted herself to that institution. And Patrick French, I want to come across to you because uh, you're, uh, you've been born in Britain, so you've experienced this firsthand as well. Uh, as far as uh, the, the Queen herself is concerned and the royal family, I mean, uh, there might have been that phase in the 90s, but more or less they've been devoted to that institution of making the British monarchy survive. And that perhaps is something that has not happened in other monarchies across the world and therefore they've fallen by the wayside. Well, yes, I think many uh, people in Britain like uh, Meghna Desai worship the Queen and the monarchy and the royal family. Um, I'm personally not one of them. I would rather that we became a republic like so many other countries around the world. But having said that, extraordinary, really remarkable that the Queen has been on the throne now for such a long time, even longer as of tomorrow than Queen Victoria. And to think that when she became Queen, age 25, that Winston Churchill was the British Prime Minister, uh, that is really something truly remarkable, I think. Mm. Uh, the, the important difference, obviously, between her and earlier monarchs is that somebody like Queen Victoria had a lot of direct political power Whereas the Queen is more like the President of India. She can't really come down in favour of one political party or another. And so we don't really know much about what she thinks. Uh, people imagine that the Queen thinks certain things or that she's a certain kind of person. But she's never given an interview. She's always extremely guarded. And she's really been a, a kind of public mystery uh, for the British people for the last 89 years.
All right, uh, Patrick, also a quick bit about the fact that uh, there are those weekly meetings that she has with the British Prime Minister of that time, and uh, from Winston Churchill to David Cameron, all have gone for those uh, weekly meetings. So in terms of influence, uh, I mean, uh, and nobody's really come out and said that uh, what was ever discussed. So in that sense, uh, as far as uh, her political interference or her uh, j just uh, her having her say in uh, matters of state, is it completely non-existent? And is that why you would say that uh, perhaps the model of a republic uh, would be better? Well, no. I mean, I think I'm in the minority. I think most people prefer the constitutional uh, monarchy in the UK. And certainly the longevity of her reign, the fact that she has had private discussions with everybody from Churchill through Alec Douglas Hume, Harold Macmillan, Wilson, Callaghan, Ted Heath, Margaret Thatcher, John Major, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown. It is incredible, that longevity. And I'm sure that the advice she is able to give to prime ministers is quite different from that of any of their colleagues who inevitably look at things in a very short-term way. Mm. What will be the immediate political or media advantage in one, week, one week's time? Whereas she is spanning uh, decades. Uh, you know, that, that, I think, probably does give her an extraordinary kind of influence. Mm. But having said that, again, we don't really know what she thinks. She appears to be quite a staid, uh, traditional kind of person. She's interested in dogs and horse racing and things like that. Uh, there's never really been anything radical uh, about the Queen. And yet, of course, Britain, in her reign, has changed to an extraordinary degree. Right. And she's been really quite remarkable in the way that she's managed to adjust to that social change. Mm. My guess is that she probably doesn't much like a lot of it, but she wouldn't display that dislike. She's always like a blank canvas to us. All right, and she hasn't changed much herself also within that period. So perhaps being that steady is one of the secrets of her success. But Sanjeev Srivastava, I want to come across to you because as far as uh, other monarchies across the world are concerned, now there have been protests. Uh, uh, Spain has a constitutional monarchy, but over there the fa royal family has been embroiled in scams, etc. And therefore there have been popular protests and uprisings. Uh, there, there have been monarchies across the world who are facing flak from uh, the uh, populace itself. So in terms of the idea of monarchy, as far as Britain and the Commonwealth uh, uh, go, uh, they're quite happy with the Queen, but the rest of the world not so happy with monarchy. How would you put it? <laughs> I really don't know. You know, today is a day when uh, one really needs to talk about Queen Elizabeth. And I've been hearing your panelists uh, and their views. And, you know, it's really remarkable. We, are, we, we need to uh, emphasize on the fact what a remarkable woman Queen Elizabeth is. She took over, like Satish and earlier your other guests mentioned, in 1952, when she was only 25. Today she's 89 years plus, 63 years, and still going as a British monarch, overtaking the tenure of somebody uh, like Queen Victoria. Mm. And if you compare her reign with Queen Victoria, it's you know like comparing chalk and cheese. Queen Victoria, uh, very emphatic, uh, very in public life, if you may. Uh, she was somebody who went into mourning after the death of her husband, wore black till the end of her life, didn't appear in public for many years, still very assertive. Queen Elizabeth, on the other hand, became the queen at a time when British was uh, on the cusp of change. Right. If you remember the 1960s Britain or read about it, you know, it was more like a French Revolution, Ranasa kind of a country where young people had little patience with the institutions like monarchy. Hmm. But the fact that Queen Elizabeth has been able to sustain this institution for 63 years plus, with dignity, with grace, is a remarkable tribute to her. And imagine, she has survived things like, you know, the, the entire mood of change in mm. Britain, survived 12 prime ministers in Britain, 10 American presidents she has seen. I was reading somewhere she couldn't go to John F. Kennedy's funeral because she was pregnant. She also survived the Princess Diana years. Mm. The only years when Queen Elizabeth was not the most popular monarch or uh, royal figure in Britain. Mm. Otherwise, she has consistently been the most popular royal. Right. Uh, but Princess Diana uh, days and years mm. were very difficult for her. So she has conducted herself remarkably well. And in the years of 1960s, 70s, 80s, when Britons all the way talked about value for money, right. I think Queen Elizabeth has set a tradition mm. where the British royalty is being appreciated and seen 
somewhere by the public taxpayer as value for money monarchy, <laughs> which is like I was reading somewhere again today, which is to Britain as uh, crucial or as embedded in their consciousness mm. or as much a part of British identity as tea or weather, bad weather especially if you may. So monarchy and Queen Elizabeth is like that. All right, interesting fact about Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth is the fact that she's uh, the person with the, uh, who has uh, her face in the most amount of currencies in the world. So that's also unique about her. Uh, that's also another world first for her. But uh, uh, Lord Meghnath, this, I want to go back to you. How essential is uh, Queen Elizabeth II and the role of monarchy in uh, keeping uh, British society together? Because British, uh, Britain has gone under a huge transformation from being, uh, I mean, it's not even completely British anymore. There have been so, such an influence flux of uh, migration and so much society, uh, societal change has happened across uh, the country that h how do migrants, etc., uh, identify uh, with Queen Elizabeth II and do they do that with much more fervor than uh, their British counterparts? So there are two things. O over the time she has been monarch, Britain is more and more defined as a country of four nations. It's a united kingdom. But there are four devolved sort of uh, states in it, Wales, I, uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and England. And so, in a sense, she holds together what is not a single nation, but a combination of four nations. Okay, we call about British, so on. But there is no such thing as British nationality, except in the passport. You know, there's a Scottish nationality, right. Welsh nationality, English. That's one thing. Secondly, as you remark, this remarkable transformation that Britain has become a multiracial country within her time. Okay, it started a little bit before, mm -hmm. uh, during her father's time in the, in the late 1940s. But you will not recognize the Britain today if you came from the 1930s, because there are areas of London where you don't see a white face. And still, the society stays together, and the, and the, and the sort of the brown people and the black people all they all feel a great deal of affection for mm. this woman because she is not discriminated. Discriminated. Right. She invites people to a garden party, you know, across the spectrum of citizens. And of course, there are people in the House of Lords, people in Parliament, mm. and so in a, and people have been given um, MBEs and OBEs and so on across all all races. So there is a kind of a, a, a holding together uh, a role she has, that here is a sort of disparate multiracial, multinational country, right. and she holds it together she, be, just by being herself hmm. and not interfering in politics, but being there as a, as a I think, as a, a right. source of affection and respect. All right. Rather than I think, I think it's quite remarkable. But think about it: that she has, she became queen when Rajendra Prasad was Rashtrapati. <laughs> right. Now, 13 presidents later, she's still there. All right, so Sadi Jacob. Uh, uh, the <laughs> fact is that Mukherjee is the 13th president. Of India. <laughs> All right, in relation to India, that's an interesting comparison, but Satish Jacob. Uh, as far as other countries are also concerned, and in terms of the British influence and uh, the British power over other countries, for example, Britain's not the largest country, it doesn't have the largest armed forces, it's not the most technologically advanced, but still the fact that there is the Commonwealth, there are other. Uh, in terms of where the Queen's influenced or the, her name is often used in terms of ex, uh, using that British influence, how critical has uh, that been uh, for Brit Britain's dominance in terms of world politics? Well, I don't think that we can involve um, the, the monarch of, of Britain in the, in the power politics of the world, mm. the Britain, because that's, you know, that thing is handled by the Prime Minister of Britain. But the thing is that we have been talking about her longevity and all that. Queen Victoria was the Empress of India. Mm. When she was the Queen, um, she was, I mean, the colonial power. Britain ruled three-fourths of the world. Right. And she was politically powerful too, mm. uh, which is not the case with, uh, with Queen Elizabeth. And yet, in terms of the estimation of the people uh, of of Britain, as Lord Meghnath is saying, that things have changed, that all nationalities are there, and all love her. So it, it is a remarkable thing for her that she, in her patience and dignity, mm. the way she has conducted herself as the Queen, mm. uh, just a figurehead, but people love her. Right. Because as I said in the beginning, I think there is some kind of a charisma 
the people of Britain love royalty. Mm. Royalty is something, you know, they do. Like we love cricket, they love royalty. Yeah, mean. there was just a small patch in the 90s yeah. when Diana's controversy, which right. was an unfortunate thing. But other than that, the other thing is that as far as royals are concerned, mm. there is something about it. Don't mm. you think that even in India, mm. the Mrs. Gandhi abolished the purses, after independence, the Maharaja is gone. Uh, but this even control today, the main political but even <laughs> today, the progeny of the old royals in India, right. like Amarinder Singh of Patiala, Jodhpur, right. and Jaipur, Sindhyas. we still love them and we still regard them as royals. All right, so there's a, perhaps a thing in human psychology, and Sheetal, you've studied history, you've been a student of history and are now teaching it, so you can perhaps best explain that what is our fascination with monarchy, and uh, as far as monarchy faring across the world is concerned, and in this new century, how do you think it's faring, and will it last, will it stand the test of time? Do we see more d democracies becoming monarchies, or monarchies becoming democracies, or does it stay the same? There are a couple of points I would like to add to the entire discussion in the sense that one comes from you, hmm. that what is there in monarchy that they have been able to survive for such a long time? Hmm. Now, it's an institution. It had existed for centuries together prior to the advent of modern democracy, uh, post-French Revolution, and when the institution was seen as the political alternative to monarchy world over. Right. But British uh, experience with monarchy and introduction of democracy was quite uh, harmonious in nature as compared to other European countries and particularly I would like to identify French Revolution and the overthrow of monarch. Mm. This was constitutional monarchy mm. and they continued to dissolve some of their powers, hand over some of their powers, embrace constitution and went as per the law, as per the demands of the people. Mm. That is why the figure what we are talking about has been able to sustain for such a long period of time. One is that she maintained the dignity of the monarchy, uh, whatever was expected, nothing went out of the four walls of the house. Mm. But at the same time, these people were able to adapt to the demands of the modern generations and modernization. Say, for instance, uh, 50 years back, nobody would have thought, you know, when uh, gay marriages were criminalized, you right. know, that something like this would happen. Or Britain will have a uh, female prime minister, or it would be multicultural or multiracial, as it has uh, come out from the other panelists. So she has been able to adapt to the generations, to the changing Times, right. at the same time maintain that. Right. Now, uh, on the other hand, why monarchies in the other part of the world have not been so successful or in terms of surviving is because they had a bitter experiences with the population. Mm where people were resentful of, you know, the kind of authority they had, the kind of ruthlessness and onslaught that mm. they did. So that is why they attempted to overthrow them. And once overthrow the throne, they never thought of, you know, bringing them back into the picture. Mm. Now, as far as uh, this case is concerned, I don't see this royal family going out of the picture. Right. Because there are many aspects of their existence. Mm. Some of the people say that they are one of the main tourist magnets, you know, of, of UK. Mm. The other says that uh, uh, when the second child of the couple, William and uh, Kate, uh, Kate were born, was born, so they said that, you know, he or she may not contribute much to the politics or to the society, but at least, at least mm. it would be a million dollar industry because mm. People follow them. They are seen as role models. People uh, look for the fashion, look for the cues, the lifestyle. The dolls were, you know, uh, coming out with the kind of dress the, right. the child was wearing. So these are the things that keep... Uh, so the institution, I think... Itself has... is so instituted hmm. that it's very difficult to take it out of the psyche hmm. and out of the society as well. I would, I would like to add, hmm. as she was saying, that the institution of royalty in England even non britishers like us in yes. India. Yeah, that's the yeah, thing. Yeah. We that's also he's love thrown it. over that colonial view. We, we would like her to carry on or the uh, British monarchy. Right. Right. Sanjeev, Sanjeev <laughs> Srivastava, quickly coming to you because that's the thing that uh, if uh, the, the British royal family has a funeral or ha has somebody getting married or a baby being born, that's global news across the world. It's as popular in India as it is in the Americas, as it is in the British Isles. So uh, it's an enduring popularity and it's a fascination that uh, is that a across the world, and as Sheetal was pointing out, now it's become a multi-million industry as well. See, we are all uh, page three fixated. So there is a celebrity fixation. And royalty is a kind of a celebrity. So uh, so a Beckham draws as as much or if lot, more, lot many more people 
than a Queen Elizabeth will. Mm. So everything has their place. A Prince Harry, Prince William, Kate, uh, and the child uh, she was just referring to, the new, a newly born daughter uh, of the royal couple, how she is becoming a fashion icon. And this happens the world over, you know, whether it was Michael Jackson or it is the Gad Singhs of Jodhpur or right. the Sindhyas of uh, Gwalior. You know, how you talk about Madhav Rao's, uh, Sindhya's dress sense and Jyotiradit's style or the Jaipur, His Highness's uh, family weddings or Udaipur uh, court of Arvind Singh Mewar's moustache. At the end of the day, most common people, I would hate to say, and we had a Republican Patrick French here in, <laughs> on the panel, we would like to believe most people very democratic, very Republican, very to hell with uh, any celebrity and all forms of royalty. But in most uh, common middle class, you know, there is that feudal streak in everyone hmm. where you love to look up to things, where you love to adore things, where you, where you love to see things and talk about things which an ordinary man will never possess. Mm. So the palaces and the, and the big mansions of the soccer stars or the Bollywood and Hollywood stars. So they are all the new age royalty. Mm. And British royalty is one of them. The great thing is that Queen Elizabeth, like uh, earlier we meant when you were comparing Victoria and Elizabeth, there is no comparison really. She ruled over an empire of 400 million. Right. And uh, what is UK right now? 130 odd million mm. population. No empress, no nothing. But she has managed to carry on that legacy with certain uh, degree of grace mm. and humility, if you may. Mm. Uh, the, even today, she said she doesn't want any fuss. Mm. And that itself has created such a big fuss. You know, mm. a big royal gun salute, a right. carriage ride, you know, family palace in Scotland. So these are things which people like to talk about. And there is an element of romance mm. and mystery and mystique. And right. that's what sells. So, royalty is going to endure, not just in UK in this form, mm. but you'll find new royals coming up in different shapes and sizes and forms. Basically, uh, people who are rich cut above the rest in terms of how they live and how they look and right. how they behave. And the rest of the world, including paparazzi, <laughs> All right, so it's, it's a contribution that the media also has a very important mm -hmm. role to play in popularizing trends. And I, I mean, as far as the royalty is concerned, they've been the trendsetters for centuries. So why blame the media? Satish Jacob, final word to you. Uh, Patrick French, I'm so sorry that we've not been able to come to you. But uh, Satish Jacob, final word. Well, I'll only say that um, I'm a bit disappointed with Sanjeev, my colleague in BBC. He has reduced Queen Elizabeth to page three. <laughs> He's calling a page three. I think I would like to hear the views of the ending thing. Last word. From Patrick. All right, we'll give, we'll, we'll give the final word that, to that, you. Okay, Patrick, we'll give the final word to you because you're the only British guy who's well, actually. I, I think the, I think the well, real point. Well, is at least the, the, uh, the BBC, the BBC India has a, so much BBC has an entire beat on royal correspondence. Let Patrick, we'll, we'll give Patrick <laughs> the final word. Sorry, Sajid. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I was just saying that I think that the real fascination in India is not with the old royal families, as with the fact that quasi-royal politicians continue to be elected. About one in three MPs comes from uh, an existing political background. So you get there a kind of dynastic continuity. And the other point I think that it's important to make is that it's easy to see the United Kingdom in terms of only past glories and post-imperialism and so on. But even today, Britain remains one of the largest economies in the world. Mm. Uh, London is the world financial capital. And in terms of, for example, high-tech in in high industries, uh, Britain remains a global leader. So it's not all about, uh, you know, elderly uh, members of the royal family or past glories. It's also about a country that remains dynamic uh, in 2015. All right, and Britain itself using uh, the Queen and that institution very well in terms of uh, keeping that dominance in uh, global politics. Uh, on that note, we'll have to wrap it up. Yes, wishing Queen Elizabeth all the very best in her longer uh, reign and may it continue as uh, many of the Britons are still hoping. Thanks very much, all of you, for coming in. Satish Jacob, Sheetra Sharma, uh, Sanjeev Srivastava, Patrick French, and Lord Meghnath Desai, all the way from London. Thank you very much for coming in and sharing your views on this one. We'll be back with another edition of Big Picture tomorrow, same time. Stay tuned.